It is Talking Reds with NordVPN. Uh, a pleasure to be here. More to come on Nord. Uh, but it is good of them to give us the leeway to be able to do more Talking Reds. As I have got Josh Sexton uh, to my right. I think as you look there for left. Uh, stage left. Actual right. And the other way around, I've got Mo Stewart. To talk about Ruben Amarim, if we're all honest. Because that broke today and we thought, well, let's do Talking Reds today and go from there. Also, we've got new microphone things happening. Uh, because the sound was a little bit odd on the last one. So we feel as though this may well have fixed the matter. Do let us know in the comments. Do do other things in the comments I hasten to add. Uh, don't just let us know about the sound because that would be remarkably dull and uncreative. Um, Mo, I'll come to you first. And I'm, I'm very I'm very taken with the fact that it does feel like things are snowballing. Now, we've got to be clear. It felt like things were snowballing around Xabi Alonso for a True. period of time. Um, there is many a slip between uh, cup and lip uh, on these sorts of matters. But the... The pull feels that way. It feels to me like it's significant to the other side of them getting a really good result against Benfica in that I think that part of this is that Sporting will want that league title in the bag, I think, before anything is said anywhere. Yes. I think Amarim would want the same thing. Otherwise, he'd feel as though it was grossly unprofessional and you don't get to where he's got to by being disrespectful to players and current club. All of that said, the longer this sort of goes now, the more it feels as though Ruben Amarim is, is rightly the bookmaker's favourite. I think so. I mean, he was the favourite from the moment Xavi said no, to be honest. And I think he, he was, was a closer second favourite behind Xavi yeah. as well that everyone gives a credit yeah. for. And I think that tells you that the processes that we are looking for in a new manager that scores Xavi highly also scores him highly. And I think that's a good thing. I think also you saw his um, press conference over the weekend where he was very non-committal in saying yeah. well, anything or trying not to say anything to piss off his current employers but also making it clear that he's not exactly going to be there for forever and ever I think that was also very informative do you think he's got to move full stop because I think he has put the Liverpool thing to one side even if we weren't linked with him even if Klopp was doing another season mm. I think he would have to like ultimately he's left in this position where he can't do any more in the Portuguese league. Yeah, he's completed it. He really has. And I mean, when you think about the way he's coming and turned what was a duopoly into not only a... Uh, I'm not triopoly? sure... Triopoly? We'll go with triopoly. Yeah, let's go with that. I really should have thought of that before. <laughs> yeah. The duopoly. But he's kind of turned it into they are now the dominant force. They've kind of gone and sped past those other two. And so you think about maybe the, there's a European football question, that's something that Sporting haven't really done well under his tenure, but maybe he thinks that this is only, it can only go worse or level from there. Now is the time for him to step up. And it's a very exciting, the idea. The European football question though, Mo, I think it is a valid one. I think what he's shown is the ability to to flat track bully that Portuguese league mm. brilliantly I mean and I genuinely mean brilliantly I've looked at the underlying numbers yeah. across four seasons you know this will now be season four um, it looks like there'll be two league titles in there a second place finish and a third place finish the third place finish being quite disappointing but mm. if there is a concern it is that it hasn't quite happened for him in Europe and the question then becomes whether or not that's to do with his approach when it comes up when, when you begin to deal with coming up against better footballers there is a thing at the minute where I look at the Premier League and the example I always use is Pedro Neto mm. the injury prone Pedro Neto but he's playing for Wolves who'll finish somewhere between 10th and let's just say 12th if he was in the Portuguese league he'd be one of the best players he'd be the, possibly the best player in yeah. the Portuguese league and that's my point here mm. which is that you're coming up against someone like you're coming up against Tony and Bueno playing for Brentford Gibbs White Hudson Odoi playing for Nottingham mm. Forest and these are in the bottom quarter quarter of the league you know yeah. what I mean and um, it's fascinating because I think that that's a valid point and we won't really know until we see it but I think there is something around how you look at your team in comparison to European competition so sporting going into games with Atalanta or Rangers whatsoever they wouldn't really be seen as the dominant team they'll be seen as a good team but not a team who would be expect to steamroll them if he was for Liverpool then he would be he would be able to still expect to play the dominant football he plays in the Portuguese league for sporting for Liverpool in European competitions. But aren't you dealing with, with players who are therefore immediately better in transition? So Neto can, <clears throat> anyone, like, you know, you put Neto up against Manchester City, it's happened this season, yes. he, made, he made a fool of Ake. Yeah. This is my concern mm. here, is it's not so much the idea of everyone raises a bit. You you go to Liverpool, go, Liverpool go from here to here, and you can say, well, West Ham, who are 10th in mm. England and 10th in Portugal, goes from here to here. It's then also then the individuals, where Jared Bowen is good enough to play for Liverpool. Yes, he is. And that's, that's what you then run yeah. into in your approach. No, it's true. And I, again, I think it's something that we're not really going to see until it's in here. It would be fascinating to see how the Liverpool squad take to his tactics because there is going to be quite some fundamental shifts in how uh, we go about things under him, not least uh, the formation. Come and, back to you on that. 
and all that kind of stuff. But I think the be- the, the benefit or that you hope that you get from it is that as much as they're playing more um, skilled opponents, the sporting squad isn't quite as skilled as the Liverpool squad. Yeah. So he'll have better players within his draft to be able to deal with them. Um, how do you feel about Amarim? Are you excited, not excited? You were very committed to Alonso when we went to the United States. Uh, that news broke three days after we got back and made us all look like idiots. <laughs> well, more you than me. Um, so how are you feeling about about, about Amarim? I don't need loads of news to make me look an idiot in fairness, Neil. Um, my, my, my main thing with Alonso was, was that sort of that rapport that we had beforehand. And I, I think that one, of the, one of the issues I've had, particularly with some of the Premier League candidates, is, is that we've almost... It, it, I mean, I mean, I don't want to be like overly tribal about this, but it almost feels to an extent like you have the opposite. Like you have your reasons to dislike Angers, Tottenham manager. You maybe have your reasons to dislike De Zerbi as, uh, as Brighton manager and things like that. Like I was on stage uh, openly calling De Zerbi a mad little goth, which was which was my uh, my strong my strong position about about De Zerbi. Uh, Amarim doesn't seem like a mad little goth to me. He seems he seems handsome. never drank Monster. Yeah, he's never, he, I don't think he's ever drank Monster. Um, he, he just drinks, no interest in mixed martial arts. He, he, I reckon he's a red wine man. He's very mm. very sort of you know doesn't have a fire stick. No, it doesn't have. <laughs> doesn't, know doesn't know anyone who sells fire no. sticks. Uh, doesn't watch that much telly, to be honest. He prefers no. to walk. Um, yeah, he's, he, he strikes me as, as that. He's got that sort of same kind of cool persona, I guess, as Alonso. I mean, he doesn't come in with that with that sort of preloaded rapport that Alonso has because Alonso is, you know, sort of de facto a, a, a Liverpool legend. But I, I am excited about it. And I'm probably excited about it because I have that sort of level of blissful ignorance around it, where where I'm worried about a Deserbi because I've watched some of his Brighton teams do absolutely mad shit down the years. Concede um, five to Everton. It, it exactly concede what was it six earlier in the season to, to Aston Villa as well and Aston Villa were great at the time but you know Brighton were the first team that Villa absolutely battered having been absolutely battered Fort by Newcastle well. yeah yeah let's um, just focus on the five to Everton <laughs> <laughs> still not over it <laughs> no, none of us are um, and, and then Ange listen like I, I, I like a, what, a lot of what Ange says but there's been times this season where I've watched the Tottenham side particularly that, that game against Chelsea feels like the one that sticks out and just been like he would be absolutely like mental and I'm, and I'm not sure you can be that mental and, and, and still win the Premier League, and that's that's what Liverpool will be will be looking to do going going again, and sort of you know looking to do that again next season. So um, I, I think I'm all in armour in on the basis that I don't really know loads about him. I and just, you like that? I just know that he's exactly exactly oh, yeah. yeah because because then then I've got it all to find out. It's, it's it's like going on dates with people when you already know loads about them. It's much easier when you don't know anything about them. You check a social profile. It, it, exactly. They're very active on Insta. You're not sure now. You, are, you you instantly have more to talk about, and I want me and Ruben to have loads to talk about. You want that? You want you want that? You want there to still be some mystique? Exactly. Uh, but, ladies, but, if you are checking this out. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking to snare Sexton uh, what you want to do is you want to keep yourselves looking mysterious uh, keep it vague uh, see how you get on thing is though the problem with that is you've got to have a good poker face because when she tells you that she hates something you love you've got to be able to play it cool and be like screaming on the inside but actually cool with it on the outside I'm brilliant at that GCSE drama I've got it, I've got it unlocked don't worry uh, excellent stuff we'll indeed uh, much ado about Sexton <laughs> um, etc etc <laughs> on the, the squad points Mo I mean, the first the thing I will point out first and foremost, Nagelsmann. <laughs> Excuse me. Good God, talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting for me. The one thing that I keep flagging up and looking at the way that he sets up in his three four three with wing backs and extra centre back and two in the midfield is Trent. Where is he going to put him? Where does he up. go? I thought that. I literally thought that that's not such a crazy idea. But then it becomes a question of does he. Have does he start there and have license to move in, and then suddenly the two becomes a three, or is he going to be asked to be fronted up alongside, uh, matched up against a striker? Or, for example, if we're playing at Brentford and <coughs> we've got three centre halves and one of them's Trent, is Ivan Tony not just going to stand on Trent yes. for every day and he's going to have to deal with that? Yes. Well, okay. Then how does he deal with that? Bit? Well, Anasio deals with it. In the okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, okay. I but this is, the, this is where the translation thing comes in. It really feels like a point. quiz for Mo. No, no, no. no, 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 no I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to make sure he's watching the show. Aerial, aerial jewels aren't, aren't great by any stretch of the imagination, but his deep progressions are absolutely off the charts. Yes. And all the players, when you look at the... Dude, I've done an analysis today, which is coming out with uh, with Josh Williams of Amarim. But when you look at the way in which they play, every single, I mean, first and foremost, every single sporting player passes to every other sporting player. Yeah, yeah. But also as part of that, the three centre-halves feed the forwards continually. Mm-hmm. They move the ball back to front really, really quickly. They've got that in the locker. They're happy to do that. So I think the idea of almost saying, right, we've got three defenders who can all progress the ball forward really aggressively and brilliantly as part of the plan. And there's literally no one better on the planet 
on that to Trent Alexander True. Arnold. But to your point, then aren't you worried that what happens is you end up over there? What I would say is that at times this season, Mo, there's been four or five games at Anfield where Trent Alexander Arnold has effectively played de facto in a back three to find space to, to begin to start space. attacks. Yes. So I don't think it's absolutely, you know, I don't think it's it's off the charts, unlikely. But I think that that could well be that becomes part of the challenge because this mm. is if he's going to play the same way. He needs defenders who can progress the ball forward brilliantly. So what do you compromise on? Do you compromise on the defending or do you compromise on the progression? And everything that you say here about Amarim suggests he will compromise on the defending. And that's the thing as well, because whether you call them wing-backs or whether you call them full-backs, there's going to be times when you're playing with three centre-backs and two guys out wide. There's going to be times when they do have to come back and you've got flat five. And essentially what that means is you've got one less attack on the pitch. And so who misses out? Like, do you then say, well, Zobersley and McAllister could suddenly go into the forward line because they're not wide forwards, they're more in tuck forwards when you've got the wing backs overlapping? Yes, you can say maybe, but then what does that mean for Luis Diaz? I think there's another question mark around Darwin in as much as... He Amarin's, loves his number nine. He does, but his number nine has to be able to keep and distribute the ball really, really efficiently. And that's something that Darwin is still getting better at. He needs. Mm. To, he's probably going to need to go up a couple of levels on I that. I think there's a bit of recency bias on that. I think that Darwin has his poorest game for four months in terms of keeping the ball on Sunday. Yeah, granted. But I think... OK, so... One thing he he's he's learning he's learning. There's no doubt about that. One my quest issue with Darwin and to be honest, a little bit with Diaz is that their instincts and the uh, game IQ just is not quite at the same level. So when it when the pressure's on, sometimes they will regress into bad mistakes or bad ideas. And I think when you're the only striker in that situation, it can be a little bit more dangerous. But by all the time, we're all just thinking about things that could potentially go wrong. He's probably in there. He's probably had the, all these conversations with uh, with um, Richard Hughes or whoever it is he's been talking to. And he said, oh, well, I've got a solution for that. We just don't know what it is yet. No, I, I'm, I'm struck by... I, th- I think there's loads and loads of potential. I don't think anything's nailed on. I think he uses midfielders in wing-back areas. Uh, he wants ball-playing centre-backs to the un- an unbelievable degree. They move the ball really, really quickly. Then when it breaks down... I, I'm not that worried by squad makeup in that. I think that you might have to make one sign and maybe two in order to get it to, to a starting point as to where he wants it. But I'm genuinely sort of, I'm quite relaxed uh, about that. I think he's got practically everything he needs apart from maybe a left-footed centre-half. Um, I think everything else, a lot of these Liverpool players have played in a number of positions already, Josh. And I think that's the thing that we saw to Mr. Waller to show positional flexibility. 100%. And, and, and listen, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing sort of, you know, I, I should say a Jurgen Klopp system because I think we can all get wedded to the idea that Jurgen Klopp has forever been this 4 3 3 and it's forever been this sort of, you know, one thing. Well, they never played 4 3 3 in Germany. It, it, exactly. Like it's, but it, but it, it, like also that 4 3 3 and the look and makeup of it in possession, out of possession has shifted so much since Jurgen Klopp's been manager and all those players who've, you know, been there throughout that time have had to be tactically flexible. Every player that Liverpool signed have had to be tactically flexible it was one of the big things we talked about in the summer when we were talking about you know the arrivals of McAllister and Sabosla in particular was there were two players who were really tactically flexible and could sort of play a, a, a variety of, of different positions so I don't see a way in which Liverpool sort of go away from that because that's been almost the, the way they've built the squad for, for so so long but then I think it suits somebody like Amarin with, with the way that you two are talking about the formations and things like that and the, and the sort of interesting things that he does with a number of players is there's, there's, there's more than a number of players in the Liverpool squad who are basically built to, to do those things are built to play in different positions are built to play different roles, sometimes different positions and, and roles within one match. I mean, we've seen Joe Gomez play as the number six this season, for Christ's <laughs> sake. Um, so, so th- this, this is this is nothing new to, to any of these players, and I think there'll be a, a couple in there who sort of relish that idea of being able to sort of you know play a play a new system, play a new role, and and, and continue to learn new things because it's a really young squad as well. That's mm. the other thing. No, I agree, and I think there's probably some lads who have been looking through what he's like and championing the bit to get him in there namely Harvey Elliott yeah. I think this could be something where if you look at the way he likes his forwards to operate in those kind of half spaces you were, he's not necessarily having to drag out wide because there's no wing back overlapping he's, his job is to basically get in and around the striker and make his job of scoring goals a lot easier that's something that Harvey does whenever he comes on the pitch anyway so you really look at the manager and think okay well I've got this really key asset that works well in my system so this season let's face it Harvey's been frustrated in how many starts he's been getting you never know next season he might be getting a lot more uh, it's the way, developments the, the way in which it's moving uh, other thing tonight is that there's two Champions League games mm-hmm. uh, that are of quite significant um, I've managed to 
uh, cutting half my uh, classic Arsenal JVC and Manchester City Brothers shirt, <laughs> sewing them together so I can wear them both <laughs> tonight, Mo. Because to I, just wanna, I just, I just, I just, I just really back the idea of English sides in Europe. You know what I mean? I think it's so important uh, for the for, 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 like. I'm EPL. At heart, I love the EPL, and I just want to see EPL the, Neil. They call, just, they call me EPL Neil. I just want to see the EPL sides really, really succeed for no reason whatsoever. I don't want them to have additional games against each other that become emotional maelstroms that mean they take their off the ball of the EPL. Of course I just not. love the EPL so fucking much. And not um, only that, but we can't be rewarding these guys like Harry Kane and Jude Bellingham who are going off to foreign countries to play. Absolutely we can't. No, no, not. absolutely no, no, no. We don't give them any encouragement because we need to keep our best players playing here in the EPL mo. mo. Um, how do you think that the two EPL giants, I, I call them my second and third favourite football teams, mm. um, how do you think they'll get on tonight? Um, I think the arsenal Bayern game is going to be the one I'm probably going to have the sound on and the Real Man City one is the one I'll be watching but not quite watching. So that one's fascinating to me because Bayern are playing terribly. They're really bad at football. But. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're nowhere near as good as I'd say the 11th best team in the EPL. No. Um, but what, <laughs> what they do have yeah. is good footballers who can pull a, a, a performance out of their ass and good footballers who know that this is really their only chance of redemption this season left and a manager who is absolutely still trying to put himself in the shop window because he's seen some of the jobs that he fancied go away and let's face it he doesn't want to be left with Man United so he's got to make sure the people want to, want to um, give him a job so this is the best way to go from Basically zero to nearly 100 in one go. So they will be dangerous, but Arsenal will have confidence. Arsenal will be able to go out there and say, look, if we stop them scoring, then we're going to win the second leg. That's exactly what their, their, their method will be. Real, it's a little bit different. Like, I think they've pretty much got their league locked up. So for them, it's a very different kind of a free hit. It's more going to be about avoiding the mistakes they made last year. So I think that one's going to be a lot more tight and tense. I think the Arsenal. Don't you think Real think they need to get a lead? I think Real. I think Real needs something to take to City. They need, I think they need to put scoreboard pressure on City. In all seriousness, I think if I think if City go to Real Madrid and don't get beat, mm. then all the panic attacks from the previous, all the the anxiety from the previous year comes back into Madrid. And you can do that. We can learn from this and all that sort of stuff. But it's mm. we've seen in years gone by that stuff's easier said than done. It is. Um, I think in a strange way, Real Madrid probably backed themselves in a one-off game more this year than they did last year. Yeah, maybe. and a lot of that is down to Jude Bellingham. Um, I think that if it's one of those games where Real will be scared of going too gung ho, even at home. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think they've got to they've got to pick the moments and they've got to they've got to turn the screw a little so, bit. So, so if it's nil nil on seventy, and then they can maybe get a one or a two nil, they'll be very very happy with that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we are here because of NordVPN. Uh, NordVPN is a way in which you can uh, firstly protect yourself online and uh, not have people being able to see what it is that you're doing when you're uh, clicking from site to site uh, all, all of that sort of stuff there's a nice metaphor of the idea that someone's not following you around a shop uh, if you're doing online shopping that I quite like if you use a VPN uh, it takes that information uh, as someone who has had people following around the shops quite a lot trust me that is a bonus you don't, you don't want that um, but the other thing that's good is being able to watch stuff that's abroad and I'm again a couple of weeks ago I was with the two of you um, I was overwhelmed and one of the things that you can do is obviously watch television abroad and we talked about the March Madness the college basketball it is an overwhelming viewership that watches that women's basketball final yeah. Mo, I mean genuinely 19 million people is the average 24 million people is the peak it is the most watched game of basketball in the United States since 2019 full mm. stop men's women's college NBA yeah. uh, it is a staggering <laughs> achievement it's one that should have resonance for women's sports in this country as well I think so. everyone continually says no one watches this there's no market for it around women's sports those people are fucking wrong uh, and the basketball has absolutely proven that point and I know you were both watching it through uh, through NordVPN in there as well to be able to watch it on American television. It's nordvpn.com forward slash TAW if you want to take advantage of it. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so on and so forth. Do check that out. There's a free period as well mm. in there as well where you can check it out. So nordvpn.com forward slash TAW. But on it, Mo, you know, that basketball achievements with that many people watching it and the quality of the match as well. <coughs> Even I know that that was an absolute banger. Yeah, it was. And that's the thing. It becomes a cultural moment and I remember if you think back to well a lot of people won't realise that the NBA 
pre um, in the like seventies, it wasn't really that great. It was still the ABA. They were the merger of like five years before, and it was really the rivalry between Larry Bird and Magic Johnson that started in college basketball and continued on into the NBA. That really kind of exploded the game, and you can see the exact same thing happening with Caitlin and Angel. Yeah, yeah, I, I, like one of the one of the like most interesting things for me this year with like the superstars who are coming through at the, at the women's level in particular. There's quite a number of them who are going into the WNBA draft this year as well. So it's probably going to be, you know, one of the all-time WNBA drafts yeah. we've ever seen. And, and there's already sort of scouts and, and executives within the NBA saying it's going to be one of the worst men's drafts they think they've they've seen in in a good few years. So I think like that that sort of imbalance. Like I'd love to see the, the viewing figures from from the men's March Madness game last night, which I, which I also sort of stayed up to watch through the VPN. It wasn't wasn't quite as close. wasn't quite as much of a spectacle in the end because. UConn are absolutely just phenoms for yeah. uh, from from sort of thirty eight wins of the season, no defeats. Um, I'm not sure for for the for, for the that was for uh, South Carolina on, yeah. on, on the women's side. Yeah, by they, the way, they shout unbeaten. out to Dawn Staley, Philly's finest, absolute legend of the game as well. So good, like ev- everything Dawn Staley says, just every everybody should be listening to. Like yes. it was it was this dead funny thing where she's like she was like really like prophesizing like pouring a heart and all this thing and all the players just dancing behind like having <laughs> yeah. having a really good time and I quite enjoy that like that juxtaposition of, of, of listen like all these young women having a really good time um, being at you know for, uh, effectively at the stage that, that the peak of their sporting careers and, and, and I think there's so many more of them who are going to go on to achieve so much more but for some of them you know college basketball is, is, and, is and will be the peak of their careers and they've, and they've managed to do it because they have a you know fantastic team spirit and a, and a fantastic coach that's leading them and it's so sort of nice for, for, for me as, as a UK fan because women's basketball has, has not been that accessible really like I was lucky enough uh, when we went, we went on the tour to, to, to meet Eric Tebow the head coach of the Washington Mystics WNBA team um, and he was saying to me you know do you get to watch many WNBA games in, in the UK and I was like I just can't really because, yeah. the, because the accessibility is not VPN. there so yeah. exactly <laughs> I, need, I, I need no VPN and I need better accessibility from, from women's basketball in general but I'm hoping that this this sort of past month of, of March Madness will be the breakthrough for that Absolutely NordVPN.com forward slash TAW got me bits confused a minute ago with it's 30 days uh, money back guarantee and it's four months free if you want to sign up through there uh, for all your sort of VPN needs uh, overseas sports right the way across the globe not just in the United States as well uh, but the women's basketball is uh, culturally significant and it's culturally significant in a global way uh, and it should actually be a real kick uh, for everyone involved in, in women's sports in the United Kingdom uh, I would say around soccer as well uh, if you can find a way to tell a compelling story mm-hmm. uh, you can find a way to get people to watch uh, what are fundamentally amazing athletes and absolutely women's basketball has proven that point begin to sum it up Mel we've got to have an eye on Thursday um, mm-hmm. Uh, for us no press conference yet he's doing that tomorrow so we don't know where the fitness is of of a couple of the players uh, before Thursday I think he's in a little bit of a bind I do wonder whether or not the the fixtures the way in which the fixtures have fallen will help him in that I wonder whether or not he goes strong Thursday off the basis of the fact that it's two consecutive home games Thursday Sunday yeah the away game at Atalanta is the first of five consecutive away games that he will have if they get through against Atalanta because when you loop all the way around the the, the first leg of the mm-hmm. we already know the first leg of the semi final yeah, is yeah. away. So it'll be five consecutive aways. So I wonder whether or not there'll be a bit of a mentality to see if he goes with what he conceives of as the strongest possible eleven to get it done. Yeah, I can see that. Although I also can see a world where maybe the what we conceive as the strongest particular eleven changes or adapts somewhat. I think again what was I was saying before about Harvey, I can see a world where he gets a start in this game as well. I can see a world where maybe one of uh, Diaz and Nunes gets a break as well. I think when you look at the way that the games are unfolded, particularly the amount of um uh, scrutiny there's been on their roles there's one of two ways you can go it can be like okay we'll give you a rest so you can be fit and firing for the Sunday game or it's ignore those idiots go out there and prove who you are it could go either way I can see a world where he does either and both but what I would say is that the cameo we got from Cody Gakpo in the last two games has been the best version of Gakpo we've seen for a while so maybe he wants to reward him with the start in this game as well um, any comments? Uh, yeah, we've had quite a few coming in. Uh, the Everest production was was one of the first people to say hi from Sunny Lisbon. Funnily enough, he ah. put which is which is interesting. Um, he was he was talking about the Ruben is the sort of guy who would go out for walks. Um, so I was right about that. Stuff, um, news. Uh, Johnny Doyle says Josh, I hear Ruben also recommends Tor as a podcast. So it's good to hear that Ruben's already got a good taste in podcasts mm-hmm. as yep. a, as about their course, famously of course. Yeah, uh, big 
Instagram for rap subscriber. Loves the um, rats. We did have a few suitors for, for me. Uh, Baldur's 153 says he loves a mysterious man. So uh, uh, hit me up, Baldur's, slide in my DMs uh, if you want to hear more about how mysterious I am. Uh, there was those one. Are slippy, those DMs. I mean, <laughs> slippy. If anything sounds like famous last words. Heavy. Heavy. Go on. Uh, there was there was a bit of Salah leaving in, in in the summer chat. I think a lot of that is sort of recent advice because similar to Nunes, I think he probably has his worst game of the season uh, on Sunday. I can't. I personally can't see Salah leaving the summer. I don't know about about you two. I mean, I think it's going to be another one where he's going to want to hear what the manager's got to say about his plans for him. And I think if he doesn't like what he hears, that's probably the only way where that happens. But I suspect that the new manager will see, oh, we've got this real generational forward here. We should probably find a way to use him. I don't see I don't see him leaving to go to Saudi Arabia because mm. I, unless the offer is just so outrageous on a personal <coughs> finance level, I just think he wants to compete at the highest level. Yes. So if, for instance, Paris Saint-Germain decide that they want to replace Mbappe and they made Liverpool an offer and then they, they could woo Salah, then I could see how that could happen. But I'm really struggling to see how this footballer, with everything he's about, goes into retirement because that's what Saudi Arabia is, let's be crystal clear. Absolutely, yeah. There's someone who's taken themselves out of, of, of being a potential suit for my DMs, Ben Jagro. Uh, I assume Josh was still doing his GCSEs. Uh, you were wrong, Mr or Mrs Agro, uh, which is a shame because I'd have loved to have taken your second name. That would have been great for the brand. Um, I think that's probably about <laughs> it. There are some, some people being weird about women's basketball um, which is always going to be the way this has this has cultural significance as Neil says for for women's football in, in the UK for men's football mm. in the UK it's it's talking about sort of sport and accessibility and things like that so uh, open up your minds normalize watching everything and not just deciding what's good and what's not good based on the gender and the genitals of the participants there we are uh, excellent stuff i tell you what we had, a, we had a moral at the end there as well I'm bang into it uh, let that go all the way through uh, everything that goes on uh, do subscribe to the Anfield wrap in the run up to this game against Atalanta and towards a league campaign that remains very 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 much live the review yesterday was excellent Sean Rogers' perspective that Liverpool just need to win the next two and then see what the league table's saying I think is very very interesting indeed that's sort of my view uh, Liverpool have got to obviously get a good result against Atalanta get a good result against Crystal Palace uh, get through against Atalanta then they've got to go up against Fulham uh, and hopefully they're the next two in the league and then they've got to go to the only side that's ever been rightly docked points twice in one season uh, that is coming up as well towards the end of April when Liverpool will go uh, to a side who have admitted wrongdoing on two separate occasions to parliamentary sorry not to parliamentary to Premier League based commissions uh, and have got away with a pretty minimal points deduction uh, given the fact that they completely lack sustainability and have broken the PSR rules and admitted as much on two separate occasions uh, uh, excellent stuff uh, Everton Football Club to come the further down the line though big day to Goodison Park for all of us subscribe to the Anfield Wrap all the build up to everything you need my road to the Derby starts here